in the big scheme of things, <clears throat> is it actually possible to avoid running into guilt? Well, not really, <clears throat> because everybody, including people who love God very much and are trying to follow him, struggle with unresolved areas of their lives. When Jesus says that he's come to seek and to save the lost, he's not joking or exaggerating or just referring to the time before you became a Christian. Everybody comes to him um, really, really needing to be saved, and we go on needing to be saved. From what? Well, really from being left to ourselves, with all the poor to shocking consequences that this has for our behavior towards other people, um, ourselves, and God. Now, some people are only too aware uh, of, of guilt, whilst others would believe theoretically that there is such a thing as guilt and they may have things to feel guilty, guilty about, but would actually be hard-pressed to give you any actual evidence. Uh, this may be because they, leave, they lead tightly confined and risk-avoidant lives, because they lack self-awareness, are, are in fact in denial, or don't reflect very much on anything, including their own behavior or motivations, or because they are esteem sensitive, having a mortifying fear picked up in childhood that if you're not very, very good, you will not be loved. Therefore, to admit guilt is quite terrifying for such people. None of which means that they avoid guilt, they just aren't that sensitive to the reality of their guilt or are terrified of admitting it. So we also like to mitigate our guilt, don't we, by using terms like lapses in judgment or something I'm not proud of. I particularly like something I'm not proud of. This is meant to give the entirely false impression that most of the time I exercise superlative moral judgment or accidentally communicates the horrible truth that I'm actually extremely proud of myself most of the time. Now, of course, in non-Christian land, there is a strong felt need to accentuate the positive because of the mantra that we have to love ourselves due to what is actually a love deficiency. In other words, because we're not connected to God, we constantly are having to fill a hole that people cannot fill. And also because we don't have a mechanism for processing things when they go wrong. But whatever we do with it, my partial experience tells me that for many people, guilt remains. And I feel like people come in here, they sing songs about Jesus forgiving them, they hear people like me ranting away, and they even take communion, and they just go, go, they walk in with the guilt, they keep the guilt, they think about leaving it, they don't leave it, they just carry it straight out. Well, we're not doing that tonight. This is an opportunity, if you come in with it, to leave it here. How do we spend as little time as possible in the company of guilt? Well, first of all, I'd just like to suggest, if you feel guilty, just acknowledge that you feel guilty. I feel guilty. I'm sorry, I actually just feel guilty. Um, <clears throat> and also, I would stop worrying about whether you really ought to feel guilty or not. Should I feel guilty? I don't know. Maybe. Let's do a bit more maths about it. I don't, can I write a pros and cons list? It doesn't really matter. If you feel guilty, you feel guilty. The antidote to real guilt and false guilt is exactly the same. For example, guilt is sometimes a real and sometimes a false symptom of grief when someone dies. It's very, very common for people who've lost someone to feel guilty about something, something they should have done, um, something they feel they should have done. Now, sometimes the things they should have done are very real. They really should have done this. And sometimes they're not very real at all. Like, for example, I met someone who was wracked with guilt for 17 years because they didn't try and raise their husband from the dead when he just dropped down dead. See, I don't know, just drop down dead. Uh, but for them, it was something that really marred their relationship with God until I was able to talk to them and pray with them. <clears throat> so I advise you to address guilt like this. Guilt, let's take this outside. There will be times of failure, even for magnificent specimens of integrity such as yourselves. And that is because we are fallen, because we cannot control everything we ever say, everything we ever think, and everything we ever do. We are unfathomable in our complexity, and we're told in the Bible that our hearts are deceitful above all things. This means that we are a mystery even to ourselves in certain respects and cannot always explain our own behavior. Our failure begins in the fallen heart with our desires, most of which have been shaped by a combination of genetic inheritance and the influence of our environment, over which we have very little control, established long, long ago, which are confirmed in us and through us by the choices we make, sometimes from childhood onwards. Now, doesn't being a Christian make a difference? It's, it's certainly true that the Holy Spirit is given to transform us. We spent an entire song praying that the Holy Spirit would come to us. I mean, that was a long prayer for the Spirit to come. Where is he? On and on. Could you just, uh, I, we, what is he, deaf? Anyway. 
So here's the thing. We've already been delivered from the penalty of sin by Jesus, of which more in a moment. We will one day be delivered from the presence of sin when we meet him face to face. But right now, we are in the process of being transformed. That's delivered from the power of sin. As we learn how to walk in the spirit. Now, this does not happen anyway. It doesn't happen as you get older and wiser or go through a sudden deliverance in Jesus' name. Transformation happens as we learn how to bring the broken parts of our lives to God and open ourselves to his transforming power on an ongoing basis. Our, tre- our previous track record of being left to ourselves demonstrates that such change is completely impossible for us, but nothing is impossible with God. So ultimately, the antidote to our many shades of guilt is the cross. So let's just go through this just for those who have brought guilt in and will feel tempted to take it out with them. Ready? Is our guilt real? Yes, it is. Or it might as well be if we feel guilty about it. Has it been dealt with at the cross? Yes, it has. How? Well, first of all, at the cross, the truth is not being concealed. Wrongdoing is judged for what it is at the cross without excuse. The horror of the cross speaks of the horror of our wrongdoing and graphically demonstrates that sin leads to death. So no one's pretending it wasn't terrible. No one's pretending it wasn't your fault. No one's pretending that a price does not have to be paid. However, this is where the wonder begins. And this is the point of being a Christian. This is why you come here rather than being a member of a golf club. You come here because of this, because of the wonder. We, the guilty ones, do not pay the price. Jesus, our representative, stands in our place at God's righteous judgment on all wrongdoing at the cross. He is uniquely able to represent us because he's fully human, although he was without sin. And he's also uniquely able to represent God at the cross because he's fully divine. This means not only that sin is judged for what it is, but also that reconciliation to God our Father is made possible. That is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ to reconciling himself to the world. So, to recap, has our wrongdoing been exposed for what it is? Yes, at the cross. Has it been dealt with or paid for? Yes, it has. Though miraculously not by us, but by the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, is the slate clean? Is our guilt taken away? Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is. This is why Paul says there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, which is a word, a technical word, meaning made just as if we'd never sinned freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, Romans 3, 22 to 25. So if God forgives us when we ask him, does this mean that sin doesn't matter? That's at least the right question to ask. If you've never thought about that, you haven't got to the starting launch pad. But you should be asking that question because Jesus' grace is free. And therefore, whenever we ask him, he will forgive us, which leaves open the possibility of us doing it again and again, right? But God has established things such that whenever we do something wrong, there is always something, there's always something wrong. There's always death in it. So, for example, if you betray someone's trust, there's death of trust. If you act unlovingly towards someone, there's death of love. There's always an element of death with sin. And if you keep doing something again and again, it becomes more difficult to stop doing it. So basically, yeah, you can, you, you can do anything you want, but sin is still sin. It still has its outworking. So it's still important for us to come to the cross, be forgiven, and seek to be transformed. Now, let us reason together. Given the lengths that God has gone to to take sin away... Who are we to retain our feelings of guilt when we sin? What are we really saying? Are we saying that my guilt is too great? Are we saying that we haven't understood what God did for us at the cross? Sometimes the latter is the problem. People haven't understood that Jesus has done it for us. That's sometimes a problem. But usually what we're really saying is that we have no frame of reference for grace. And we can't entirely be blamed for that because we don't live in a world of grace. People love you because you're their child. Um, They favor you because you're their employee. And they like you because they're your friend. Uh, They might like you because you're from the same country. 
right? But there's always some kind of qualifying thing which means they like you as opposed to they don't like you or they, or they don't like you, whatever, that. So basically, grace is a free expression of love given because of the source of that grace. So grace comes towards you in Jesus because of Jesus, entirely because of Jesus, because Jesus is grace. So Jesus offers uniquely something that is free, that is a free gift that's not dependent on, de on, on deserving or earning. What we're conditioned to expect is that we have, if we, put, if we do something wrong, we have to put it right. That's a knee-jerk reaction we all have because we're not used to grace. We're not used to living in a state of grace. <clears throat> we're taught to believe that if we failed, we have to put it right. And of course, the point of grace is that it can only be freely received. It cannot be earned. It can only be received as a gift. And, you know, if you're a Christian, how do you receive that gift? Well, you, you do it by faith, which is the magic with God. Faith is the magic with God because you don't access anything from God except by faith. Honestly, I think generally if I said to, to quite a few Christians, well, God will forgive you if you climb this mountain and then there are these 25 Herculean tasks you want to do and then you know, write the greatest novel ever. I think generally quite a lot of Christians would be much happier with that because the onus would then be on them, right? Whereas God is sort of, he is humiliating us by simply saying, can you just receive the free gift? It's a contradiction of everything that we've been taught, everything that the world expects us to believe. But it is the way he operates. And so you simply receive it by grace. It's a free gift. Take the free gift and run. Take the free gift. Got a problem with guilt? Oh, hang on. Oh, no. Wait. Um, <clears throat> Ultimately, all wrongdoing is an offense against God. It's a statement of self-reliance. It's a contradiction of who we're supposed to be. It's a manifestation of lack of trust in God. But let us reason together. If God has judged our behavior to be wrong and dealt with our wrongdoing himself because he's infinitely kind, forbearing, and gracious towards us, who are we to continue to stand at a distance? Would it not be better just to fall at his feet and gladly accept the free gift of forgiveness? We can do it when we take communion. There's no point in protesting. Yes, but I should know better. It's true that you should know better, right? You definitely should know better, but that's not news. You should always have known better, but you didn't. Nothing's changed. Got a problem with guilt? You leave it behind tonight. It's a special offer. One note only, you lucky, lucky people. Free yourself by accepting the forgiveness of Jesus. Then take yourself off the hook by forgiving yourself. That's another part where it goes wrong for Christians. Sometimes they'll receive Jesus' forgiveness, but they don't forgive themselves. Now, you have to go the whole hog. You have to receive his forgiveness, and you have to take yourself off the hook because God in Christ was put on a hook for you. So you don't need to suffer because it's done. So take yourself off. That's why James tells us, oh, hang on a sec, no, no, no. Um, is this a fair deal? Is this fair? It isn't fair, but it's infinitely gracious. That's why James tells us in James 2.13 that mercy triumphs over judgment. Grace is not about giving people what they deserve. Hence the innumerable parables of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' parables tell us about the priority of grace. And I especially like the parable of the workers in the vineyard. So basically, a guy hires people at different times of the, the day to work in his vineyard. He hires some first thing in the morning. He hires some a little bit later on. He, he hires some around lunchtime. He hires some about 4 o'clock. And then when, they come, when it comes to pay time, he pays them all the same amount of money. And the people who've worked all day under the stunning sun can't believe that they've been paid the same as the, the, the sweatless upstarts that turn up just before it's time to clock off. Anyway, so in a contemporary retelling of this parable from a Jewish perspective, uh, the reason that people get paid um, the same amount, even though they've started working later, is because they're exceptional workers. That completely misses the point of the parable. The point is that God is very happy to give his grace to absolute duffers. He likes giving his grace to duffers. That's the point. So every time you protest, but I'm a duffer. I'm a spiritual duffer. I shouldn't be here. Do you not understand duffer? I'll translate that. Um, I, I'm, I'm useless. I'm a useless person. I'm, I'm a failure. I shouldn't be here. If you, if you only knew all the things I did, you wouldn't let me in the building. Right, you. Particularly you. Jesus is looking for you. As he says, the sick need a doctor. The healthy do not. I mean, how true is that? 
Let us reason together. It's only as we return to an open-hearted relationship with God that we stand any chance of being changed. Open-hearted and feeling guilty cannot coexist. So yes, you should have known better, or yes, you still shouldn't be struggling with, with whatever it is theoretically, but if you want to stop, you have to reconnect with God. And just as we can only enter, enter into this relationship by His grace, so we can only continue on, continue in it, continue on in it by His grace. Just as Jesus' death liberates us from the penalty of sin, his death is also liberating us from the power of sin. You are in Jesus, which means you are in the death he died to sin, but this only works for you if you're living closely with him, confessing your weakness and receiving his strength. Remember, Christianity is a relationship from first, to, from first to last. It's never a set of rules. It's not an ethical code. It's a deep connection with God who loves you. The only way in which we receive the transforming power of the Spirit is to be in this relationship, not theoretically, not ticking a box, not going to church on a Sunday, but deeply connecting to God who loves us. That's the only way in which we are transformed. And... In order to do that, you have to be able to look into the face of God, your Father. If you can't do that because you feel guilty, you will not connect with him. So you've got to leave guilt behind. Guilt stinks, but not as much as this slimy brother shame. Guilt is the awareness that I've done something wrong. Shame is the pervasive feeling that I am wrong. So this isn't now a what my conscience is worried about one specific thing. It's just a pervasive feeling that there's something wrong with me. Guilt beats, beats us up a bit, and then shame jumps on top of us and overpowers our sense of self. Either because we draw conclusions about ourselves based on our behavior, often our continuing behavior, or because of the negative verdict important people have actively or by implication pronounced over us, like, you are worthless, or you are unlovable. Internalized verdicts of this kind are self-destructive in themselves, but they also lead to patterns of behavior that enforce the verdicts. May I um, say a word to our dearly beloved members of the LGBTQ plus community who are here. I know that many of you have been forced by the church to choose between your faith and your sexual identity. And I believe that a perfectly robust biblical argument could be made for the integration of these two things, as you know. And I encourage any of you who've yet to come to a place of resolution about this in your hearts and minds to learn from those who have. And here, we have a number of very mature people who have had to go through this process. Some of them are here this evening. But it, will be e it would be easy for you to find one of those and to have a conversation, and you can ask me for help in that respect if you'd like to. Um, the reason I say this, because double-mindedness about anything does nobody any favors. And could, f for instance, it can leave us with questions like this. So you're listening to this talk, but you might be thinking, yes, but what, what, what he's saying, does it actually apply to me? Does this apply to me, this stuff about guilt and forgiveness? Because I feel like there's this chasm between my faith and my identity. So does this apply to me? And I keep going backwards and forwards about that in my mind. Does what I'm saying to you, members of the LGBTQ plus community, about guilt and forgiveness, does it really apply to you? Siblings, it does. It does. It applies to you as much as it applies to me. The antidote to shame is to insist on seeing yourself as God sees you. Let's take this outside shame. You are not who you think you are. You are not who other people think you are. You are who you think the most important person in your life thinks you are. It's called the theory of the looking glass self. You are not who you think you are. You are not who other people think you are. You are who uh, the most important person in your life thinks you are what you are, what they, what you think they think you are, the most important person in your life. So if the most important person in your life is God, he loves you, and you are his child. That's it. You are who you are. You're his child. Dearly loved, dearly beloved, child of God. That's who you are. So if it is God that truly defines your identity, then you'll be able to say, yes, I, I am. I am a child of God. That's who I am. I'm a child of God. You know that one? I've seen that over and over again as well, actually. Just looking at you, there you are behind you. It's who I am. It's who I am. I'm loved by you. It's terrible, terrible butchering of language, but a brilliant song.
usually we see ourselves as we believe our parents see us or sometimes very significant other people in our lives. And that is why damage and brokenness, particularly in parent-child relationships or between partners, can be so very painful to us. But ultimately, we are called to believe that we are who God thinks we are. So simple truth number one is that shameful behavior is incompatible with our identity as children of God and strictly unnecessary because we've died to sin, having been included in Jesus' death. But simple truth number two is that shameful internal convictions about our worth are incompatible with God's conviction of our worth as his children. To live in the certain knowledge of God's love for us is to live without shame and vice versa. Why does God love us? God loves us because he loves us, because he loves us, because he loves us, because he is love. He cannot but love you. Nothing you do will make him love you any more. Nothing you do will make, you, make him love you any less because his love is not dependent on you, thanks be to God. It's dependent on him. It comes from him. Sure, shameful or guilt-inducing behavior can spoil our experience of our relationship with God, but nothing can separate us from his love. God knows exactly what we're like, but he continues to love us anyway. Listen to this. His love is patient. His love is kind. Keeps no record of wrongs. His love endures all things from us. Perseveres despite us. His love will entirely win out in our lives in the end. He wants us to believe in his love for us and, not, and to stop being defined by the voices of our past. Our self-worth is not based on what other people have said or say. It isn't to be judged by what happens in our lives, how things work out. Our self-worth is based on the love of God in Christ Jesus in all things. Think about these verses from the Bible, which are going to come up now. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only son that we should not perish, but have eternal life as a gift. 1 John 4, 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave his son to die for us. 1 John 3, 1, see what great love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. How about a couple of examples of grace to end with? Peter is said to be the rock upon which the church is built. Maybe you've been as inconsistent as Peter, promising Jesus everything and delivering nothing or going back on God's word to you, like when Peter stopped welcoming Gentiles into the church under pressure from some of his peers. But have you ever denied Jesus three times? When asked, you know, oh, you're a Christian, have you ever denied that you're a Christian? Just blatantly lied about it. It's just a question. Ever denied that you knew him? Ever called down curses on Jesus' name? Because Peter did. But if you haven't quite failed Jesus to that extent, perhaps you could allow Jesus to reinstate you too. Philip, Julie, Mike, Sarah, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Let's consider Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament and is more responsible for the definition of what we believe about Jesus than anyone else. You may have been so zealous that you dismissed other Christians because they lacked the courage that you had, as Paul did with Mark. You may have chosen speaking the truth over speaking in love, as Paul sometimes did, as he tried to guide the churches he founded. But have you ever overseen the execution of a Christian in your religious seal? Anybody murdered a Christian because you're more religious than them? Just a question? Hands up, anyone? All right. Because Paul did do that. And yet God broke into his life, reconciled him to himself, and used him more powerfully than anybody else. So if you haven't quite managed to fail Jesus to the extent of Peter or Paul, perhaps you could allow the Lord, your God, to commission you or recommission you as well. Let this be a very bad day for guilt and shame and a very good day for our relationship with God who loves us. Shall we stand? We're going to take communion.